<laughs> I've never done this before. I don't. I don't even know what to expect. I haven't done it since I was a kid, so I don't know okay. what I'm expecting. Okay. You good. Okay, let's try. It. It's all about how much you let out, yeah. because it's the more you speak, the more it all <laughs> changes on you. Okay, so this is what I sound like on helium. Uh, it's like a little fusion reaction in my in my belly. The byproduct making me me sound all wonky. <laughs> Can I do the whole show like this? Okay. <laughs> So we have got the nerdiest show for you today, and I can't wait to share it with you. So I'm Andrew Chang. This is About That, the show where we're all about explaining and expanding on the news. And man, in the science world, this is huge. We have a successful fusion reaction. And that is totally what just happened at a federal research facility in California. Minus, okay, minus basically everything about that scene, except for the last part where the guy says, we have a successful fusion reaction, because that is what researchers did. They created a fusion reaction where, and this is the important part, the energy it generated was more than the energy it took to trigger. The dream scenario here is that someday this discovery will give us access to a near limitless supply of clean energy. Okay, so what is fusion? Well, fusion is where you take two atoms and you crush them together. And when you fuse them in that crush, a neutron fires out like a bullet. Like, kind of like imagine squeezing an orange seed between your fingertips. Pew, right? It just shoots out and you harness that energy. Now, when we talk about fusion, the easiest example to point to is the sun, right? The sun is just a big old ball of fusion, but recreating that kind of energy on Earth is super difficult for three reasons. So one, the sun, is much bigger than the Earth, which means it's much heavier, which means its gravity is kind of just like crushing atoms together anyway. On Earth, that's what this little speck of dust is. That's a lot harder to do. Two, the sun doesn't have to worry about where its energy goes. It just sort of radiates out, right, in whatever direction it can spew it into space. When we do fusion, we have to be so careful to contain the energy. Otherwise, I don't know, you could get a nuclear bomb. And finally, to, to fuse atoms, you need like a crazy amount of heat, 100 million degrees Celsius. But here's the crazy part. All three of these problems, humans have already figured out. The issue was a fourth problem, how to get more energy out of the reaction than it takes to trigger it. But they just did it. And all it took was 192 high-powered lasers firing 2.05 megajoules of energy at this tiny fuel pellet of hydrogen, superheating those atoms, fusing them to each other, and then like a bit like popping popcorn, with enough energy, you get an explosion, a stream of neutrons firing out like bullets. And you remember squeezing those orange seeds between your fingers, just all of these bullets going out, carrying about three megajoules of energy. More energy out than went in. That's the breakthrough. Fusion for, you know, like a very, very short time, like less than a billionth of a second, but in a way that was energy efficient and clean. Because you see, the byproduct of fusion is not radioactive waste, it's helium. Now, Kieran Outshorn is here to join us. And uh, Kieran, how are you doing? <laughs> Uh, better. I'm good. I can't hear my voice is back to normal. You've again. recovered. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's good. So, so I want to ask you, I mean, it, it is an astounding discovery, yeah. right? Now, you're going to help us understand not just the goals, but, but maybe some of the, the problems around this, because mm -hmm. the way we've structured this chat, you're going to tell us about fusion, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, uh -huh. so, so let's start with the good. And, and 
the potential and the applications are sort of limitless, right? Yeah, well, so I think that when we think about that sort of framework that we're talking about, the good, the bad, the ugly, the, the good is the easiest one to sort of think about because the prospect, the, the potential for nearly limitless clean energy is is hard to overstate. Yeah. It's incredibly exciting. It has the possibility to completely and radically shift the way that we live, uh, the way that we exist in the world, the environment around us. And it has a lot of people excited, uh, including uh, Wojciech Rasmus. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Alberta who we spoke to about exactly this. You have no idea how, how important this is. Because now you're having uh, proof experimentally that you can control the action. You can start to, uh, to design different schemes for energy production. Uh, and that will be uh, really, uh, as you call it, societal uh, shift. I mean, we will solve the problem of energy, period. So this development, this breakthrough, uh, I feel like news like this has the ability to cut through the seemingly omnipresent sense of existential dread that a lot of us are, <laughs> sure, are living in. Sure, right? Well, since the pandemic, I suppose. The pandemic, right? war, you want to talk about climate change, right. it's, it's all crushing. And although this isn't a silver bullet, I mean, it's not going to solve uh, climate change tomorrow. It's not going to, we're not going to see uh, conflicts over resources, you know, end the next day. Even though it isn't that silver bullet, it is a really exciting step forward uh, and, and presents sort of, you know, a real ray of hope. Well, you know what, Kieran? Can we just skip the bad and the ugly? Let's go home. We're done. <laughs> uh, okay, so let, let's go through the bad. What's your sense of, of the downside here? Yeah, okay, so it, it's important to bring ourselves back to Earth because we can sort of dream for the future, but we need to be realistic. And the main three things that we need to be thinking about are the cost, the, the complexity, uh, and the timeline. Mm. So we can start with the complexity. Obviously, this experiment that happened in December, incredibly complex, took us 80 years of trial and error just to get to, sure. to where we are now. Uh, and what's going to need to happen next is we're going to need to refine that technology. We're going to need to make it better and we're going to need to make it smaller because what they did was just a proof of concept of, of what this uh, technology could do. We need to move that to commercial viability. So we talked to a couple different people about this, about how to sort of bridge between those two things. Uh, and one of them was Edwin Lyman. Okay. Uh, he's the director of uh, nuclear power at the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists. And he talked a little bit about this. This facility itself, uh cost uh, $3.5 billion, that's US dollars, to construct. And uh, it was several decades of intense work. You would be looking at least uh, you know, 10, 10 to 100 times that figure to try to bring this to the, the point of a first of a kind uh, uh, power plant. So the last thing that we need to talk about is the timeline. And we've talked to a number of different people, read a ton of articles, and the most optimistic timeline that we're looking at here is a decade. And that really mm -hmm. honestly is very optimistic. I mean, there's lots of examples of humanity when we're motivated and when we have the proper resources achieving really incredible things. But we should be realistic about this. It's going to take 10 years, 20 years, maybe longer to try to move this technology into something that we can practically use. So, so my renovation plan is to install a holodeck <laughs> in my basement and then fly to work in my spacecraft. Uh -huh. Not yet. Well, I mean, like, depends, depends. <laughs> <laughs> like, VR is coming a distance, man. Sure. Uh, okay, so the ugly, yes. we have to talk about yes. that. What is the, the, not just the downside, but the really big, potentially bad downside. Yeah, so I think that when we think about ugly, there's really one thing that comes to, nine, uh, to mind, and it's the, the potential for weaponization, and specifically mm -hmm. weaponization uh, in that there's the potential for the proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Now, it is important to talk about the fact that like organizations like the International uh, Agency, um, the International Atomic, Atomic Energy, Energy Agency, Agency yeah. uh, uh, they've said pretty clearly that they don't think that uh, technology uh, specifically focused on fusion uh, technology would be able to produce or be developed into weapons weapon. But it is worth noting that uh, fusion is actually technically used in the modern day uh, weapons that we have now. It's part of a chain reaction that actually increases the yield of the uh, fission detonation. Hmm. So, uh, you know, it's not totally clear what the future might be there. You know, we have some people saying that this technology can't be transformed into weaponized. You know, we've seen other examples where it, it is explosive, uh, quite literally. Right. Um, so that's sort of one of the things that we're going to have to be aware of going forward. We shall see. Uh, Kieran Outsborn, thanks so much. Hey, thank you.